Good day and welcome to the PFAS Treatment Real World Experience with Ex Situ Treatment, an in situ research and development conference call hosted by Jim Schultz. My name is Sally and I am your event manager. During the presentation, your lines will remain on listen only. If you need assistance at any time, please key star zero on your telephone and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. You may submit web questions throughout the presentation by clicking on the Q&A tab. Type your question and send to all panelists. These will be addressed in the Q&A session. And I'd like to advise all parties this conference is being recorded, and I'd now like to hand over to Jim. Please go ahead. All right, thank you for that, Sally. Um, well, welcome everyone to the monthly technical webinar series hosted by Parsons. And today we have an exciting talk um, led by Les Cordon and Dan Griffiths. And the title you can see here, PFOS Treatment, Real World Experience with ex -situ Treatment and in -situ Research and Development. The topic resides around ex -situ and in -situ treatment options for PFOS in groundwater and surface water. Next slide. All right, before we get into the details, a few housekeeping items. One, all phone lines will be muted until the Q&A session at the end. Number two, questions may be submitted in writing at any time using the chat feature, but will not be answered until the end. And the chat feature should be on your right-hand side of your WebEx panel. And before you ask a question, we would appreciate it if you'd please state your name and location before asking the question. Next slide. And a brief agenda. We'll first do guest speaker introductions, then we'll go into a core value moment. From there, Les Cordon will take it off with the ex-situ treatment for PFOS compounds, and Dan will pick it up with the in-situ treatment strategies and emerging technologies. And if we have time in the end, we will do a Q&A session. So, Presenter introductions. Um, first, we'll start out with Les Cordon, a professional engineer. He's a vice president at Parsons and subject matter expert in industrial water, wastewater treatment practices. He's got 35 years of experience in design, constructive industrial wastewater treatment and groundwater and leachate treatment systems. Um, he really specializes a lot in emerging contaminant experience, PFAS, dioxane, PCBs, mercuries, and pharmaceuticals. And secondly, we have Dan Griffiths, a professional geologist. He's a subject matter director for Groundwater Restoration Practice Group and has 23 years in experience in soil, sediment, and groundwater investigation and remediation with a real focus on complex sites that are um, difficult, that, that pose certain difficult challenges. And lastly, he's very experienced in emerging contaminant uh, contamination such as PFAS, 1,4-dioxane, organic metals, mercury, and lead. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dan, who's going to do our core value moment. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, so Parsons has six core values that we use to manage our business and make uh, business decisions, everything from, you know, investment in new technologies to, uh, to how we operate our, our core businesses. And those core values are, first, safety, and then quality, integrity, diversity, innovation, and sustainability. And I thought it would be appropriate for uh, this presentation to focus my core value moment on innovation as uh, our, our presentation really focuses on innovation in terms of uh, treating PFAS. So next slide. Thanks, Les. Uh, so Parsons is, is recognized throughout the environmental industry as a, a company that brings innovation and technology to all of the solutions that we develop. Um, we've been at it for quite some time, and we've really been focusing on technological advancement and the, the uh, delivery of innovative solutions uh, for the last 10 years or more. And there's a list of projects in the center of the slide that are recent, and some of them are actually ongoing. That, that really were completed uh, on time or ahead of schedule and under budget to, to deliver an opportunity to our, our clients as well as the surrounding community to redevelop uh, formerly impacted sites for, for beneficial use. Uh, the first couple are, are actually still in motion, the North Cal Northern California Industrial Site. Uh, the remediation work was completed this past December and that site is currently under redevelopment as a uh, warehousing uh, facility 
uh, for the betterment of the community as well as our as our client base. Um, Navy Treasure Island, great example of a site where we help the Navy uh, accelerate closure and uh, turn back up that property for residential use. Uh, to try to alleviate the, the housing crunch in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Fort Bragg, great example, a site in North Carolina where we have closed uh, 23 sites on Fort Bragg, allowing the Army to reuse those, uh, those impacted uh, parcels for, uh, for their beneficial reuse. And a series of other examples where, uh, where we've brought innovation and uh, intelligent use of, of new technology to accelerate closure and advancement of our, our clients' goals as well as the community's goals. Next slide. And key to our own uh, technological advancement and helping our, our, our clients with uh, innovative solutions is our research and development laboratory in Syracuse, New York. It's a treatability study lab that we operate internally. Uh, we run studies for our clients to optimize uh, selection of absorbent materials for uh, PFAS treatment as well as treatment of other contaminants. Les will talk a lot about uh, the work we do in the lab uh, to help our clients. But we also operate studies within our laboratory environment to, to advance technologies. Uh, we have a series of studies coming up that are designed to better our own understanding of, say, absorption kinetics for GAC versus uh, ion exchange resins. And we also have some studies coming up to advance the te technological development of in situ destructive technologies for specifically for PFAS, the contaminant that's uh, getting a lot of attention in the news these days. So we use our own lab not only to help our clients develop new methodologies, but also to advance our own um, technical needs and our own uh, technology development goals. Next slide. So with that, I'll hand it over to Les to talk about uh, optimization of XC2 treatment. Well, thanks, Dan. This is Les Cordon. I really appreciate everyone's time on this. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the basics associated with the the process that we go through when we're evaluating how to treat PFAS, if we have a PFAS issue that we need to deal with in either a groundwater, it could be a leachate, it could be a construction water, dewatering volumes, uh, and it, uh, it could also be a surface water. Um, right now, if you need to treat this material quickly, and, and it's likely, I'll talk in a minute, uh, that you, you'll probably need to treat it to a very, very, very low level. Um, the likely technology that you're going to start with if you really need to treat it for a direct discharge to a surface water under an, uh, some type of a Clean Water Act permit or, or to a POTW, you're, going to, you're probably going to be looking at some type of either absorption technology or ion exchange technology, okay? And we have a lot of experience with both, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the procedures that we go through when we're evaluating and optimizing the treatment of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a groundwater or, or some type of a water that has a PFAS constituent in it that needs to be treated because the decision, there's, there's decision points along the way. If you do a little bit of work up front, you can save significant amounts of money in your operation of that system uh, to, by optimizing the adsorbent or ion exchange material you use. And there's certain techniques that you can utilize to help that process along and, and end up saving you money in the long run. We've been working with PFAS compounds for quite a while now, even though they're new to the scene. This is a picture of a treatment system that we constructed about 10 years ago now that we've had and that we're actually operating. We've been operating it for the past eight or nine years. Uh, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, an old PFOA treatment facility that's treating recovered groundwater. It uses activated carbon, and there's a lot of iron in the water. You can see the picture down here to the lower right. And you can see that that's, a, that's an iron cake. I'm going to circle back to that because there's been some changes on the way some of our clients are managing these residual solids uh, currently that have been PFAS kind of exposed. So uh, I'll circle back to that in the future. Um, what I want to say on the PFAS regulatory framework right now is that there's really a lack of, P, of PFAS regulatory um, emphasis at the federal level. So what's going on is there's certain states that are more impacted than others. There is another graph that I didn't put up here that shows the extent of PFAS uh, in the country. And pretty much there's a lot of PFAS being detected all over the country. So uh, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, but there are certain states that are jumping in because there's a lack of federal uh, leadership in the role. And there's a lot of states that are coming in and they're, and they're putting in 
uh, uh, pending rules, actual rules, actual standards that are that are uh, that are uh, uh, applicable at the at the state level for groundwater and surface water or leachate, et cetera, that were, where these compounds might be present. And what we're seeing is for the compounds that are regulated, we are seeing numbers that are extremely low. Like in the low nanogram per liter range, we're going to be regulated at, which means um, we have to treat to very, very low levels. And the technologies, you know, the adsorption and the ion exchange technologies are capable of treating to those low levels. Well, what I wanted to establish here, though, is if, we're, if we need to treat for these compounds, uh, whichever ones are being regulated, it's likely that we will be treating to the low near, near detection limit, which is the low 1 to 10 nanogram per liter range, which, which is just extremely, extremely low, okay? Here's a, a list of compounds, PFAS compounds. It's kind of alphabet soup. These are lists that are show, that show up in EPA's 537 analytical um, methodology, and then there's so also some additional compounds that are being regulated in the country that come out on an on an addendum kind of uh, analysis to this analysis, which is referred to as the Table Three Plus compounds. Okay, uh, PFOA is up in here, uh, molecular weight around 400. PFOS is down here, it's about 500. Of course, PFOS is found in a lot of uh, uh, firefighting uh, sites that have, have occurred to, due to the use and, and uh, firefighting foam. PFOA is, is kind of a prevalent one that has been known about and is, is treated in a lot of locations. There's compounds down in here that, that uh, uh, are currently being regulated in some locations. And I'm gonna present um, some information here that's not really specific to any compound, but it's, it's based on real data and the trends that um, are, are demonstrated by that data will, will help, help me explain to you how we go through and optimize the system. So just looking at the compounds here, okay, this is PFOA, okay? So when we're thinking about how I, if, I, if somebody threw that compound in front of me and asked me how I would treat that, I, I would look at it and say, okay, well, it's a high molecular weight compound. It's completely saturated. It's perfluorinated, and there's this carboxylic acid functional group sticking on the end of it. Um, I would say if I'm thinking about adsorption, like on something like activated carbon, what I want is a nonpolar compound that doesn't really have high solubility. Uh, this compound has some polarity because it's got this, this, this functional group on the end, and it's it's – it's it's high molecular weight, which hap, which which is definitely true, but it's also so fairly soluble in water. So I'd kind of be on the fence. I'd say, well, we would try activated carbon. Well, we know now that activated carbon works on this compound, but we also know that at certain pHs, uh, a, a portion, you know, uh, this compound will be speciated between this this form that you see right here with the hydrogen attached, and as the pH goes up there will be a dissociation occurs because it acts like an acid, and we know that the pK, the, the pH at which that dissociation begins for this compound is at a pretty low pH. So in, in the pHs where we experience groundwater and surface waters, a large fraction of this compound might actually be in, in the dissociated phase with the, with the hydrogen ion off in solution, and this would be a negatively charged anion, basically, which is why um, the the... the the possibility of ionic anion exchange is on the table for treatment of these compounds along with sorption, okay, which I'll talk about. Um, here are some other compounds that are lower molecular weight, but you can see these compounds also have this, this, this carboxylic acid functional group. So the same thing pertains to them, but if I was to look at this compound here, for example, and say, how would I treat that? I'd be like, eh, I don't know if carbon's gonna work too well on that. Maybe, maybe ion exchange would work better because this is lower molecular weight. Uh, and, and, and more polar, okay? So let me talk to you about some procedures that we use when we're trying to evaluate quickly um, the most cost-effective way to treat these compounds when they're present, and we actually really need to treat them in a rapid, rapidly for a surface water discharge to extremely low levels. So the first thing I want to emphasize, and hopefully you all wait, walk away with this, is that you absolutely need to do some testing using the actual matrix of water that you are treating, okay? 
vendors might come to you and they might have an absorbent or an eye exchange media that they like and they might tell you that it, it's the best for all conditions, all cases, it's going to work on, you know, whatever PFAS you have to treat in any situation. That's absolutely not true. <laughs> I can tell you it's not true. You need to back away from that. They should be asking you questions like, can you send me a sample of your water so I can check to see how well my media is going to work on your on your matrix and your con contaminant of concern, okay? So I'm going to talk to you r right now about a basic uh, adsorption technique that's used and it's been used for years and we are, we're applying it to PFAS right now and that's the preparation of an adsorption isotherm. And the way that we do that, and this is actually with activated carbon in this case, the way that we do that is we take a number of bottles, we add various quantities of pulverized activated carbon to those bottles. We put the actual water to be treated in those bottles, and then we allow them to equilibrate over a period of a few days, and then we measure the equilibrium concentration of the, of the PFAS compound of concern, okay? And then we can calculate on the y-axis how much of that PFAS compound has been sorbed per amount of adsorbent in that bottle. Okay, and the importance of that is that, and, the, and then this is a trace, okay, and you can model this trace and curve fit this, okay. The importance of the amount of, of adsorbent, of the amount of contaminant that goes on the amount of adsorbent, you want to, the, the higher this trace is up here, the better off you are, because that means there's more efficient adsorption going on and that you will use less adsorbent material to achieve your treatment, okay which means you will spend less money in O&M buying adsorbent material. In general, this stuff doesn't sorb that great, okay, but it sorbs. And, and uh, uh, it sorbs and you can, you can treat to very low levels in, in most instances, but not always. But uh, this is the, 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 the process that we go through. But if, but if you're using lower levels of adsorbent material, than you otherwise would, that's, that's something that you're really looking for because that's an O&M cost. It could be a significant O&M cost to treat this material. So this is an example of an activated carbon adsorption isotherm. Now let me show you the importance in, uh, of, of really understanding the matrix that you're treating. These are two uh, isotherms that I'm showing here. They're extrapolated isotherms. Okay, and we're looking at a, this is a, a medium, uh, uh, molecular weight uh, PFAS, branched PFAS compound, okay? And this is, these are, this is based on actual data. Uh, we're using the same adsorbent, okay, in, in both cases, which is activated carbon, a, a Calgon activated carbon. In, in groundwater number one, it's got low background uh, con concentrations of other PFAS compounds. They're there, but it's, it's not a, a heavy, a heavy mixture of other PFAS compounds, and it's a lower complexity background in general. And in groundwater number two, it's much more complex. So there's much more potential for, for uh, competitive adsorption going on here. And you can see that the amount of adsorbent material, because this curve for, for the more complex groundwater is well below this curve for any concentration that I pick here, that that you're performing much better with this to, to treat this wastewater than you would be if you were treating this wastewater. You would use approximately a third more adsorbent material to treat this water, okay, on a given day than you would to treat this water. And this is the kind of information you can get from doing this kind of a quick test to, to understand, you know, well, oh, geez, how much carbon might I use if I were to treat this water with activated carbon and, you know, I've got a problem and I need to treat it in a construction water like, you know, five months from now to build a project kind of thing, okay? Let me talk a little bit about ion exchange resin because I'm going to talk to you about the, the, the procedures that we use to do preliminary screening on ion exchange resin. As I mentioned before, because these compounds can be anionic, there's actually some of them that can be both anionic and cationic, but generally, uh, the, the acid functional group, uh, you know, at certain pHs, a, a portion of it will be in the anionic that is negatively charged form. So there are anion exchange resins that, that can be effective to treat these compounds, all right? Here's a list of some that are currently available. 
Calgon, Dow, Purolite. Okay, we've having, been having most success recently with the Calgon and the Purolite uh, resins that are out there, okay? Um, these are not normal anti-exchange resins. Like, these are not the resins that you would use if you were to treat sulfate or chloride in your water that's in the milligram per liter range to polish for, say, a boiler feed water. These are extremely specialized resins that have kind of a quaternary amine functional group, and they're, they're based on a chloride, you know, uh, recycle, uh, a chloride uh, uh, anion exchange model. But it's, it's known that there's some ion exchange going on with these ion exchange resins, but it's also known that there's some level of sorption going on with these ion exchange resins too. So it's both ion exchange and sorption happening. Okay, so when we evaluate these resins, we've been, we've been using the isotherm technique on these resins also to get an idea, at least preliminarily, how, the, how a certain water and a certain matrix, how, how the resin might respond to a certain water and a certain matrix, just like we would do with activated carbon. So this is an example of, a, of an isotherm generated using, uh, I think this is one of the Calgon uh, ion exchange resins, okay? The same process that we went through that I showed you for the activated carbon we're using with the ion exchange resin, except in this case we don't pulverize the resin. We use the resin as is. Okay? Everything I'm talking to you about here is for non-regenerable, non-on-site regenerable applications, too. I want to make that clear. So you would send, if you're using this material, you'd send it off to be regenerated just like you would with the carbon. Okay? So now I'm going to show you an example based on real data, okay? This is a, a higher molecular weight branched PFAS compound in, uh, with a, in a complex groundwater that has high uh, background concentrations of other compounds that could compete that may or may not need treatment. But this is looking at the specific compound that we're targeting. In this instance, we would look at, uh, you know, a certain compound. And this is an example of looking at, on the top trace, which is the more favorable one, this is activated carbon. This is a higher molecular weight, about around 350 molecular weight. The lower one is the ion exchange resin, okay? So what we're looking at here is, in this case, the activated carbon actually, from this isotherm information, actually is performing better, significantly better than the ion exchange, than the ion exchange resin for this compound. So this basically indicates that for this groundwater matrix and this specific water that we have, um, ion exchange, this ion exchange resin will not outperform activated carbon, okay? Trying to stress the importance of doing these quick studies because uh, there is no absolute answer to these, to optimizing these systems that you can apply from one to the other. You actually have to test the water. Here's an example of the same water. Uh, actually, it's a different water. This, so this is a lower molecular weight, shorter chain branched PFAS compound, okay? Uh, and looking at now similar isotherm technique using ion exchange and activated carbon. In this case now, the ion exchange resin is outperforming the activated carbon. The, the efficiency of absorption is greater on the ion exchange resin than it is on the activated carbon. Okay, and uh, that's probably because it's a lower molecular weight compound, it's probably more polar, and it's more well suited for, uh, for absorption slash exchange on the ion exchange resin. Does that mean the ion exchange resin will be one that you would go to, go with on this? It looks like in some instances here, the ion exchange resin could be as much as two times more efficient, like you would absorb twice as much per unit ion exchange resin that you would activated carbon. Um, not necessarily so, you'd have to work the money out, okay? So activated carbon costs anywhere from a buck 50 for regenerated carbon to a buck 75 for virgin carbon per pound. Ion exchange resin is somewhere in the five to $10 per pound range. Uh, actually, I haven't found any for $5, I'm just putting that number in there. The lowest I see right now is $7 a pound and that's the resin that we were just, that I was just talking about. In other words, that resin costs about four times as much as the as the activated carbon. So I would need to see five. I would need to see four times the improvement in sorption capacity by that exchange resin to to hit a break-even point for for a 
for a uh, for an absorption system that's treating to extremely low levels and that uh, is 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 not being regenerated on site. It's being sent off site for disposal or regeneration. That doesn't mean that in all cases the ion exchange resin won't work. Certainly there are applications for ion exchange resin where that will they'll work. And there definitely could be a situation where you have a low molecular weight compound that you're going after and you have other compounds that are more efficiently resumed, removed on activated carbon. So you may have activated carbon up front and then you may have that ion exchange resin on the back end. And all this calculus should be done. It can be done relatively rapidly, but you just you should be looking at all of these types of things before you pull the trigger on deciding what system you're going to put in to treat to treat some of these waters because the operation cost can be extremely high if you make the wrong decision. So the next technique that we'll often use after we do uh, absorption isotherms, and a lot of times for most systems, for a lot of systems, we can give you some we can give very good information just based on doing those preliminary adsorption tests. If we have a, a more involved system, a, more, a higher flow rate, we'll often want to do a column study also, which basically simulates a full-scale adsorption uh, system. Uh, this is a, a picture of, a, of an adsorption of, of a column study that's set up. There's four columns in series. This one's using activated carbon. <laughs> and what we try to see, and we feed that actual water continuously, and the, the, the columns are set up at, at a hydraulic loading rate that's equivalent to what you would have in a full-scale system. So the information is completely scalable to a full-scale system. Okay? And what we look for when we do these is that we want to see breakthrough of the influent, column, uh, of the influent uh, target uh, contaminant. We want to see breakthrough at least through the first column so we can see the breakthrough wave front. Okay? Uh, and here's an example of some data, okay? This is a lower molecular weight branch PFAS compound. Uh, and here's the influent trace. This is real data about this mean. We're looking at about approximately 110 mil, uh, microgram per liter stream here. Uh, and it's being fed to, to uh, a column. And you can see initially this is the, the effluent from column one, and the open circles are the effluent from column two. So you've got, basically we're, we're getting complete absorption here for this volume that's being treated. At this point here, we're starting to see breakthrough, okay? And then you'll see this is the breakthrough wave front, where ultimately it, it ends up at the same concentration as the influent, okay? Uh, down here, you can't really see it, but there is a little blip here where we actually at this point had a detect, and this detect would represent probably a, uh, uh, since we're, we, we, would, we would need to be treating to very, very low levels, this might represent a, uh, at, the, at your discharge limit, okay? Most systems that are in operation these days, old school systems that are out there, not necessarily treat PFAS, but just carbon systems, usually you put two carbon beds in series, and the way you run them is when the first bed begins to break through, okay? You would change that carbon out, you would place that first bed in the lag position and you would feed the influent water to the, what was previously the second bed and it would be that type of a scenario. With respect to some of the, the treatment of some of these PFAS compounds, if I look at this breakthrough curve the way this is and if I change this out at this point right here, okay, I would basically, uh, and, and I looked at the mass, if I, if I integrated underneath this curve here, which is the influent curve to the top of this curve, this really represents a mass that could have been sorbed by the carbon in that first bed, okay? It, 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 it represents unused GAC capacity. So if I were to change the carbon out right here, which is the way many systems are currently operated, I would basically be foregoing the potential absorption capacity of the bed that I just changed out. Okay, so if I'm running it that way, I could, I could take a chance and continue to run, but the problem being that when we're being regulated to the low nanogram per liter range, there are a lot of things that could happen to make this blip over here. I could have short circuiting in the bed, I could have desorption. If I changed my influent uh, wells that I'm pumping from and I have low concentrations coming in, all of a sudden, if this influent trace shifted, I could have desorption, which definitely happens. It happens those adsorption isotherms are reversible. Okay, so there's a lot of things that could happen. I wouldn't feel comfortable running just two beds and running a bed 
way out to here without putting potentially a Clean Water Act violation, you know, on the table. I really wouldn't want to do that. So one, one thing that we're looking at and we're actually specifying for some systems where it makes sense is to just go and use three columns in series. Okay, now if I'm running three columns in series, the effluent from this column would then go into a third column. So then I would feel very comfortable about running this first column to complete absorption, com complete um, uh, exhaustion, and utilizing this excess capacity that's available here. Well, what does that mean? Well, for, for this real wastewater that we have, this real uh, water that we're treating, if I went with this option versus this option, and I was and I and I utilize, and I ran this first column to complete exhaustion, and if I'm treating 500 gallons per minute to treat this compound, that means approximately 100. And I'm and I'm using granular activated carbon. That use that means approximately 140 thousand dollars in GAC savings per year. For, the, for this specific situation. If this was an ion exchange, disposable ion exchange media, it would go up by a multiple that significant, you know, significantly, be significantly higher uh, potential savings. Okay, so a lot of times when, after we do the, the isotherms, we will often advocate doing a, a column study. The column studies also we can we run it, have run in our lab. We just use one inch columns that are completely scalable also. I want to mention one other thing before I finish up here and wrap up, um, and this is something else that we've seen recently. This is, an, this is actually the same column study. This trace might look familiar to you. This is from the previous uh, slide. This is the influent, same compound, which is a lower molecular weight branched PFAS compound. This is virgin activated carbon, okay? Typically, we use regen carbon, and, and for example, that, that one that we've been running for eight years, the PFOA, we use regen carbon on that, and it works pretty well. Uh, in this instance, for this lower molecular weight compound, we ran a side-by-side -side test using regen carbon, and the regen carbon just didn't perform. You can see it broke through preliminarily almost immediately. We had a lot of non-steady. The wave front's really weird uh, going through. And so I just wanted to mention to you, just so you know, that Sometimes regenerated carbon might work, sometimes it might not. Regenerated carbon costs at least 25% less, 25 uh, cents less per pound than virgin carbon. So the type of carbon, even from the same manufacturer, the same type of carbon, whether it's regen or virgin, can have an impact also. So I thought I would give that piece of information to you based on real data. So let me wrap this up here. Um, things that you need to be thinking about when you're looking at uh, treatment right now. You have to treat something right now to a really low level. You're probably going to look at adsorption. You're probably going to look at ion exchange slash adsorption uh, 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 technology. You really need to look at potential matrix effects associated with the actual water that you need to treat in order to specify the right adsorbent or a likely right adsorbent so you don't get in a situation where you're burning a lot of like much more adsorbent than you need to. And because of the O&M costs could be could the the O and M cost differentials can be significant. Okay, I would like to mention also if you have nuisance constituents in the in the water like iron, et cetera, you you may need to take care of them. Okay, just like any other old fashioned groundwater treatment system if you're treating groundwater. One thing I want to mention that we're seeing that's a little bit of a change is on a lot of these treatment systems you will definitely have to remove suspended solids that might be present in the water. So you will be generating possibly a solid stream. If you have to remove iron, you're definitely going to re generate a solid stream. Uh, a lot of our, uh, because of the elevated profile of these compounds these days, a lot of our clients are disposing those residuals, like that iron cake that I showed you earlier. Uh, they're, they're, they're now disposing of them in a secure landfill, okay? There's no law that says you have to dispose of them in a secure landfill right now. These are not hazardous wastes. They actually have low concentrations of PFAS because the PFAS doesn't like to partition into the solids in general. But I'm just telling you that a lot of our clients are choosing to do that, okay? Another thing that you should be aware of is if you are looking at using adsorbent or ion exchange resin, you really, need to, you really should be doing due diligence on the folks that are selling that resin to you if they're taking it back or, or that, or that uh, uh, adsorbent, if they're taking it back and disposing it for you, you should do due diligence on them to see what are they doing with it, 
Are they, are they regenerating it? Are they reactivating it? For example, with carbon, if somebody like Calgon, they take it and reactivate the carbon, which means they re-incinerate it under a pyrolysis type approach. But Calgon can give you data to prove to you that there is a certain percent reduction, and it's like four or five nines, like 99.999 uh, percent destruction of PFAS compounds. You need to be looking for the same. My recommendation to you would be you need to be looking for the same on any other vendor that you're using for ion exchange slash adsorbent material or any other adsorbent material, any other carbon adsorbent material, okay? One thing else I want to mention briefly, like really quick, is we also are seeing some applicability. There are some engineered uh, bentonite clay um, products that are currently available, and we are seeing some potential applicability for those products too, and I just wanted to mention that. Okay, that's all I've got. I hope you got something out of that, and I'm going to pass it, pass it back over to Dan. So go ahead, Dan. All right, thanks, Les. Um, so Les did a really nice job of presenting some of the tools that we use to optimize uh, hydraulic control systems and XC2 treatment for PFAS. I wanted to spend the last half of this presentation talking more from a, a higher level perspective in terms of, of developing solutions for, for problems that we see today using the technologies we have on hand. A lot of the tools that Les talked about are, are used to optimize and implement those technologies. And I'll also spend a little bit of time at the end just talking about new technologies that are under development and are, are likely to emerge into the marketplace over the next uh, year or two or three. And on this slide, you see two pictures. The one on the left is a recirculation system, and the one on the right is a um, in situ sorptive uh, treatment system that we developed for surface water. Next slide. I wanted to start this conversation with a timeline, just so we can kind of orient ourselves on how rapidly the remediation um, system is developed for a particular contaminant after it's recognized as a environmental or, or human health hazard. I use PCBs as an example to understand that timeline because it is in the past and the timeline is fully developed. And then I compare it to the PFOS timeline on the bottom of this slide. And you'll see that for PCBs, they were really recognized as environmental issues, human health issues in the 60s. And then as an industry, we really spent the next 30 years developing remedial technologies, investigation technologies for PCBs in the environment, um, really capping with the understanding that PCBs are actually microbially, biologically degradable in the natural environment, and that was uh, discovered and documented in, in the 90s. And then we go on to uh, developing remedial technologies moving forward. PFOS is it's a much later contaminant, of course. It was recognized as an environmental and human health issue in the 2000s in the United States. And the, since the early 2000s, the tools to investigate and ultimately, ultimately remediate PFAS have been under development with that, that marker of the definition of biological degradation of PFAS occurring about this time last year, April 2019. So you can see that the remediation timeline for PFAS is, is much condensed, it's much shorter, and we're operating on a much more accelerated pace than we did for PCBs. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, I think as an industry, we're much more experienced, much more technologically capable than we were in the you know, 70s and 80s. And as a result, the remediation timeline for PFAS is, is much condensed. And that really tells you in the the summary uh, point for this slide is that in the coming year, two, three, there's going to be a host of remedial technologies coming out on the market that we can all, you know, add to our toolboxes to address uh, issues regarding PFAS. But we understand and we realize that even though new technologies will be coming out in the, in the very short future, our clients do have problems today that need to have solutions developed and implemented today or, or tomorrow. And they can't wait a year or two, which uh, leads to the next slide, please. So we understand that uh, there's problems that need to be solved right now. And right now, the best option to solve those problems is hydraulic control with XC2 treatment, which Les talked about previously. And you know, pump and treat 
as a standalone solution, it's gotten kind of a bad rap. It's considered a, um, a passe technology, but it really has good application even today for PFAS and for other constituents. And as long as it's, it's understood and the objectives surrounding a hydraulic control remedial solution are, are well stated and well negotiated, and the system itself is designed properly, it can achieve remedial objectives very efficiently, um, you know, cost efficiently as well as time efficiently. I mean, there are some issues that, that need to be addressed in terms of, of applying pump and treat alone. As you all are well aware, as environmental professionals, pump and treat by itself takes a long time to achieve uh, objectives, particularly if those remedial objectives are not optimally stated, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, pump and treat is energy and resource intensive. You gotta pump the water out of the ground, you gotta treat it in an XCT treatment plant, and then you have to discharge it typically under an NPDES permit uh, regime. So there's a high cost to implementing pump and treat. You gotta drill the wells, you gotta put the pumps in, you gotta build the XCT treatment system, and there's a long-term cost to uh, maintaining and operating that system. But Hydraulic control can be optimized, and Les talked about a lot of tools to do that. There are also design tools that we can take advantage of by simply combining technologies that we have and are, are usable today. And some examples that I'll talk about in the next couple slides are combining hydraulic control or pump and treat with locate barriers, which is uh, soil mixed grout walls or sheet pile, PVC or steel. Um, recirculation, which is taking advantage of the water you're extracting and the reinjection of that same treated water to achieve your hydraulic control. Funnel and gate is a great way to more efficiently and with a higher degree of surety achieve uh, capture. And the last one I'll talk about at the bottom, my personal favorite is uh, sorptive barriers. Next slide. So the first step to, to implementing hydraulic control in, a, in an efficient way is to very carefully develop the, the remedial objectives for that system. If the remedial objectives are, are stated properly, they're stated in terms of protecting a specific receptor. Um, as an example, you would implement a hydraulic control system to protect a property line and prevent contaminant mass migration across that property line. You would protect a particular receptor, uh, as an example, a surface water body where impacted groundwater is discharging or even a, a you know, water supply well. So in terms of remedial objective development for a hydraulic control system, first, the hydraulic control system should be considered interim, not a final, uh, albeit total solution for a site. And the objectives for that specific remedial component need to be very carefully stated, again, in terms of preventing PFAS migration, um, preventing impact to a specific receptor. And the remedial objectives that you wanna kind of avoid because they really are not achievable with a straight up pump and treat system are to say, remove mass from a source area within a unit period of time, you know, achieve X document, documented concentration reduction within a source area. Uh, and of course, achieving site closure with pump and treat is usually not, uh, not achievable. So with the properly defined remedial objectives for a hydraulic control system, the technology can be applied uh, pretty efficiently and pretty effectively. Next slide. Okay, and just a note in terms of the next uh, five or seven slides, all of our clients that we're working with for, for PFAS mitigation, are they're pretty sensitive about their sites and their site data as they should be given the the perception and the strong public interest um, and, and, and uh, uh, fear surrounding PFAS. So all of the, the concepts that I'll present over the next few slides are, are really, they're concepts, they're not specific to any particular site or uh, region, um, and I present them as concepts specifically for that so that I can get the message across in terms of, of ideas and, and uh, um, strategies that we use every day to mitigate PFAS impacts, but they're not related to any particular, you know, client site or region or state or, or anything like that. So the first one I wanted to talk about is is probably the simplest of the of the four that I'll present, 
uh, for groundwater. And it's really just a combination of a low K barrier, uh, which could be a soil mixed grout wall or a sheet pile wall, PVC or, or steel, depending upon your site conditions. And the combination of that low K barrier with hydraulic control on the up gradient side of your, your barrier. And in this case, the barrier itself is what is meeting your objective in terms of preventing contaminant mass migration in the down gradient direction. The pump and treat or the groundwater extraction is really just hydraulic control to ensure that the low K barrier is not overtopped or that you, know, you get groundwater running around the ends. So in this case, it's a way to achieve your objectives to stop that plume migration towards your property line or towards your water supply well efficiently and most cost effectively by combining these two technologies. Now there are some things to be aware of. The, the addition of low K barrier, of course, increases your installation costs. In the long run, it reduces your O&M costs because you have to pump less water and treat less water to achieve the same objective. Uh, but it does represent an increased cost for, uh, for installation. And uh, there are sites out there that uh, locate barriers just are not good fits for. Of course, you know, these are all tools in a toolbox. One doesn't fit all. Um, as Les said earlier, for the, uh, the XC2 treatment, there isn't one magic silver bullet that'll, that'll work for everything. Next slide. Um, and this is an example of using recirculation to achieve hydraulic control. In this case, it's, a, it's essentially a means to achieve a, a hydraulic curtain to stop uh, plume migration in a particular direction, well, in the downgrading direction, by extracting water, treating that water to remove your contaminant, in this case PFAS, and then re-injecting that water to achieve the same level of hydraulic control. And in this case, you're, you're using pump and treat, which is an old technology, but you're using it in, a, in an optimized way to achieve your objective at, at lower cost. In this case, you're avoiding NPDES permits because you're not discharging your, your treated water to a ditch or, or surface water body, but you are adding the need for injection permitting. Depending on the state that you're working in, that injection permitting is relatively easy to obtain, um, and in some states, it's, it's a little more difficult, but it will require uh, monitoring and sampling of that treated water before it's injected to ensure that it meets the standards of the injection permit. Uh, it, this is a means to achieve the same hydraulic control, the same objective, with a higher degree of surety than standalone pump and treat, although it is more difficult to design and it's, it's not applicable to all site conditions. Uh, this is a technology or, or an implementation strategy that you would not use for, say, a low permeability site or a site where your soils, soils are very heterogeneous and you run the risk of, of having, you know, water ponding around your, uh, your injection wells. So next slide. Uh, of the three that I'm going to present for groundwater, uh, this is my personal favorite. This is called a funnel and gate approach. Uh, it's an old approach that has been in use within the environmental industry for quite some time. But for PFAS, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that there's new technologies coming out essentially within the next few months to the next few years. And this application is, is most flexible in terms of the ability to update and upgrade to incorporate new treatment technologies. And it really just focuses on the implementation of a low K barrier or a, a wall um, in a chevron pattern, and then the installation of permeable gates at the tips of each of the chevron pattern uh, locate wall application. And in this case, the gate wells have pumps in them, and you just extract the water from the gate wells to achieve hydraulic capture. So essentially, as the groundwater flows in the downgrading direction, it comes in contact with the funnel or the locate wall it's diverted down the side of the, the funnel to the gate, and then it's extracted. This is a little bit more expensive than a standard low-K wall, uh, soil mixed grout wall, or a sheet pile wall, because uh, once you add all the linear uh, total lengths of all the funnels, it's a little bit more wall to put in, uh, but not significantly more. The beauty of it is that you have groundwater flow driven and steered towards these, these gates such that 
if a technology were to come out on the market in a year or two years that is an in situ destructive technology, you could very easily replace the pump in these extraction wells with that in situ technology to make them reactive gates. And that actually brings us to our next slide. This is essentially the same concept, except that the gate wells are, are filled with absorptive media. And this is a technology that can be implemented right now. We have the absorptive media and the capability to implement that media as removable socks hung in the wells. It has the same values as the funnel and gate system that I just talked about in terms of a very easy, very simple ability to upgrade for new technologies. In this case, there's no pump and treat. There's just um, uh, absorptive media hung in the gate wells to absorb that contaminant mass as it flows through. This is a great technology, however, given the, the, the paradigm that we currently have, the absorptive medias that we have on the market and the, the absorptive kinetics of those media, this application is really limited to a site where groundwater flow and contaminant mass flux is relatively low. Um, if this were implemented on a site with high groundwater flow and or very high contaminant concentrations, you would find yourself uh, replacing the, the, uh, the absorptive media socks on a very high frequency, which would, of course, uh, drive costs and, uh, and all of the challenges associated with replacing those socks. Next slide. We've also developed some remedial paradigms for surface water. You know, there's a, there's a number of cases where PFAS impacted surface water is a significant issue. And a great example is landfills where PFAS waste has been disposed and where a storm event occurs and that storm water that's running off the landfill is impacted with, with the PFAS from the landfill. So you get storm water events where um, PFAS mass loading increases, you know, offsite as, as stormwater. Uh, there's also a number of cases where fire training areas or fire fighting foam hydrant test stands have areas of, of surface soils or near surface soils that are heavily impacted with, with PFAS, in that case, a triple F uh, derived PFAS. And during a storm event, you know, rainfall occurs, it hits the ground surface and it picks up that, that uh, PFAS and uh, rinses it into the storm system. Um, also, seep locations where impacted groundwater is surfacing as, as surface water. And these surface water impacts can be addressed using existing technologies um, with a little bit of creativity. Uh, next slide. This is a, an example of a capture system that, that we've developed. It's really just a very simple French drain system that is uh, implemented to cut across a, a surface water channel. Um, in this case, it's a, it's a surface water channel that runs all the time, but this could very easily be implemented for a stormwater channel, channel as well. And it's just a means to capture that impacted water and pump it to an XC2 treatment plant for, uh, for later disposal. Next slide. And this is the, uh, the figure that was on my uh, introductory slide. Um, this is a system that, that we developed to treat impacted surface water. It's the implementation of a, a, uh, uh, a wall, low permeability wall, and the establishment of a reactive gate in the middle. And in the gate, we have established uh, wire gabion baskets filled with granular activated carbon, such that the surface water, the impacted surface water, runs through our gabion baskets the PFAS in that surface water is absorbed onto the GAC within those gabion baskets, and clean water runs out the, the down gradient side or the downhill side. And there, there is O&M associated with the system. You gotta pull the gabion baskets out periodically and replace them as the absorptive media within the baskets is, is depleted. But the beauty of the system or the advantage of the system is that um, it's in situ treatment. You're not pumping water out uh, you don't need an NPDES permit for discharge because it is in situ within the stream channel. And it's, it's very uh, applicable to like a stormwater system wherein the stream channel may not run all the time. Maybe it only runs when it rains. But when the storm, storm event occurs and stormwater is running down your channel, it can run through the gabion baskets and, and be treated um, such that the PFAS in the stormwater is removed and, and clean water comes out the other side. So a great example of uh, just a creative 
application of existing technologies. Next slide. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of remedial technologies coming out on the market in the next year or two. Here's a couple examples of technologies that are that are definitely on the way. I mentioned earlier on my timeline slide that this time last year, the microbial degradation of PFOS was documented, and it was the, the uh, publication is right there on the first bullet. And that is really, it, it was a great example of, of a laboratory study that was that was capable of and ultimately documented the biodegradability of PFOS. Now, in that initial study, the degradation rates weren't great. The, the result indicated a 60% reduction of PFOA plus uh, PFOS, but it's a great start, and it really allows the industry to understand that this stuff is degradable. Uh, reactive metals also show great promise. There was a study, again, last year published that indicated that uh, the nickel iron nanoparticles are capable of degrading uh, PFOS compounds um, in a laboratory setting. So another great example. Next slide. All right, electrochemical oxidation um, has actually been under research and development since about 2008. There have been a number of uh, studies that have been completed most recently last year. And it's a great example of a, of a technology that is being designed and developed, and we actually are, Parsons is collaborating with academia to further develop this technology. And finally, in the last uh, 30 seconds or so that I have, treatment trains. You know, there's a number of technologies that have already been documented to be at least partially successful in degrading our PFOS constituents. Combining those technologies is a great way to achieve better results using the technologies you have. And we have an internal uh, R&D project underway to combine low temperature thermal and, and oxidation to achieve uh, uh, the degradation processes that we want. And next slide. All right, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go through this quickly. Essentially, the, the message that I want everybody to take home with them is that while the best solution that we have right now to, to meet our requirements and solve our problems is hydraulic control, there are additional technologies that are, that are on the way. And the, the key to meeting our, our current needs is to design your systems with well thought out objectives and flexibility to, to take advantage of those uh, new technologies that are, that are gonna be coming out. And that's what I have. I think maybe we have a minute or two left for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please key star, then one on your telephone, record your name, and then press the hash or the pound key. Alternatively, please type your question on the WebEx by clicking on the Q&A tab, type your question, and click send to all panelists. So just to remind you, if you'd like to ask a question, please key star, then one on your telephone, record your name, and then press the hash or the pound key. Well, thanks, Dan, for that presentation. Um, I'll pick up with the, the questions and you guys can answer them, um, reading them off the chat feature here. So I'll start with uh, Fernando Alvarez's question. Assuming, and he's out of Irving, California, assuming you've determined you need to eliminate suspended solids prior to treatment of PFAS itself in your treatment, how do you do that? Do you add standard filters or decanters upstream? Yeah, it, it, it depends on the, uh, Fernando, it depends on the, uh, uh, whether you're to construct, it might, it might be construction water, which in, in that case it could have a lot of solids. You, you might have just a frac tank up front to drop, to do a coarse removal of solids, but certainly if you're putting in, uh, if you're using some type of absorptive media or ion exchange, there will definitely be a, filtra a filtration up, uh, up in front of that. It will either be a bag filter or possibly uh, a multimedia uh, type filter, like a sand garnet filter, okay? And I would like to take a moment to remind everyone that PDH credits are available. You can contact Scott Hartzell of Parsons for that. And if there are any lingering Q&A questions that we don't answer now, we can um, please be in touch with Scott and we can answer those questions offline. Are there any other questions for the speakers? We have none on the telephone at this time.
Okay, well, unless anyone has a, an additional question, um, I'd like to announce the next technical webinar, which is April 8th, 2020, again at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And the presenter is Shamsul Chowdhury, a PhD in professional engineer. Uh, the topic will be coastal resiliency and sea level rise, managing new concerns during remedy design. And thank, every, thank you for everyone for joining. Um, a special thanks to Dan and Les for an exciting presentation. I think it was really great to see some of the um, work that Parsons is doing and getting out ahead of much of the emerging contaminant issues as they, as they come up and lots of great innovative ideas. So with that, we will close out today's webinar and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. That concludes your conference call for today. You may now disconnect. Thank you for joining and have a good day.